Okay, but we'll get started in the interest of time. Hello, my name is Rajiv Jairaman, the founder and CEO of Nolscape, one of the fastest growing experiential learning tech platforms in the world. In the last few months, we have hosted webinars to help all of us make sense of the world around us. It, it has changed quite a lot by inviting thought leaders and experts who are intensely clued in um, to what's going on around us. Never waste a good crisis is something we've heard a lot in the last few months. But what does it actually mean? How do you make use of a crisis to turbocharge growth? To help us understand this, we have with us one of my favorite props, Paddy Padmanabhan. A little bit about Paddy. Uh, Paddy Padmanabhan is a professor of marketing and the Unilever Chad Professor of Marketing at the INSEAD Asia campus. He's the academic director of the Emerging Markets Institute. He directs the leading business transformation in Asia, the leading effective sales force program, the INSEAD leadership program for senior executives in India, and the certificate in business acumen program. His current research focuses on business opportunities and challenges in the developing economies, economic crisis, and their implications. He's among the top 250 most highly cited scholars in the world in the field of economics and business. His research has received numerous awards, including the recognition in the 10 most influential papers of management sciences first 50 years. He has consulted, delivered executive education courses and acted as an expert witness for various companies across multiple countries and industry segments. A few of you might uh, know this. Firstly, um, my story with Paddy is, you know, Nolscape started at the INSEAD Singapore campus in 2008 in Singapore, right? Paddy was one of the first few professors we worked with to create the crisis simulation. The year was 2008. Many years later, he tells me the same simulation is um, valuable in the context of COVID as well. Talk about shelf life of um, a product. Today, Paddy will focus on how to leverage a crisis to rebuild your business. He will specifically talk about his upcoming book, The Phoenix Encounter Method, that he has co-authored with Ram Charan and his colleagues at um, INSEAD, Ian Woodward and Samir Hasija. The book comes out in October. Please add it to your must-read book list. Welcome, Paddy. Over to you. All right. <clears throat> uh, let me see if I can share the screen. All right. Can you all see the screen? Yes, Paddy, you can put this on uh, slideshow mode. Yeah, okay, all right. So let me try and be quick on this. Rajiv, thank you so much for uh, the introduction. So what I'm gonna do is take a few minutes to actually set up the stage and then afterwards actually get into the book, which sort of talks about what is it uh, that you need to know about how you leverage the crisis, okay? So in terms of setup, this is a data slide that I find interesting because what it shows is we are living in a world today where we have more devices than we have human beings. Essentially saying the world has never been as connected as it has ever been before. And I think the best way it came to me was actually a picture that a student of mine sent. And this is a picture he sent me from an MRT station in Shenzhen. And this is of a beggar. And the wonderful thing is, in this new world of digital, social, whatever you call it, what we have here is a beggar who says, look, I don't accept cash. Here's my QR code. And to me, there's nothing more powerful in terms of indicating or showing how consumer behavior has actually changed because people across the board are basically becoming a lot more digital and a lot more literate in terms of what they can do with digital and technology. Okay. Many of you must have seen this or have read about this. 
Here's a gentleman who started a company that sold something as simple as shaving gadgets. He took on the Gillettes of the world who were selling blades and cartridges for $25, $30. He sold it for a dollar. And what is fascinating is all he said was, look, early on you paid these guys a fortune to get your cartridges. You went to the store, you picked it up, you did everything by yourself. I'm going to do a completely new business model. And the new business model is shaving as a service. Everybody has heard about SAAS. This guy put that thing on top of the head. And the beauty of it is what you now have is Unilever shelling out a billion dollars for this gentleman's company. And if you go to the website, what you'll realize is this gentleman is still the CEO and they morphed across a whole bunch of other categories, which is no longer just shaving. Most of you have heard of Singles Day. This is what Singles Day did for Alibaba in November 2019, a few months back. And everybody likes to think of Alibaba as Taobao, e-commerce, B2C, B2B, etc., etc. And what I still remember is I think four years back, a good friend of mine saying, look, you know, I'm actually not worried about City. I'm not worried about JP Morgan. I actually don't think Jamie Dimon gets it. The person I'm worried about is somebody nobody else worries about. And that person who was talking about this was Piyush. And what he said was, look, what you have to realize is in today's world, there's so much disruption, so much change. If I, as the CEO of a company, don't change my mindset and don't look at just the people I look at, but also think beyond, I'm going to be dead. And Piyush is one of these companies, one of these CEOs who actually sort of turned their company around, done some phenomenal things, where even in the past few years, and even I think just a couple of months back, they've been considered one of the most sort of forward-looking banks, if you will. But the point that Piyush was telling me is to say, look, if I look within the traditional boundaries of my industry and I don't look beyond, if I don't change my mindset, DBS would be dead. Okay. And what he was getting at was everybody thinks Alibaba is e-commerce. What they don't realize is Alipay is their killer. And Alipay, if we let them go, will get into financial services across the world, which it has. Now, thanks to regulation, it has probably not been able to do as much disruption as it could. But the point here is not regulation. The point here is as a CEO, can you take a look ahead to say, what does it mean for you? And I think for people in the companies to ask the same question, not just of the CEO, but also of the people in the company to say, look, who are the people who can actually help look beyond just the normal? Because the normal is no longer valid. We have COVID. We have all kinds of crises. Okay? We have natural crises, we have financial crises, we have crises like you know that oil platform going up in smokes. And all of these are crises which are things we are used to. And now what we have is COVID, which is a crisis which is unlike anything else we've seen before. And while at the end of the day, COVID starts off as being a health and a humanitarian crisis, the problem with COVID is it's morphed into any and all kinds of crisis you can imagine, whether it's a humanitarian crisis, a social crisis, a currency crisis, a banking crisis, a debt crisis. So what we are dealing with COVID is a crisis we've not sort of dealt with before. And this is where my dear friend, who is my co-author, came up with this. He says, look, you know, Paddy, the Chinese have a word for crisis, which is Weiji. And what it does is it has two things. 
which is crisis is danger and crisis is an opportunity as well. And this is something that Ian, Samir and I, along with Ram Chirna, have been working on for the past three years plus before COVID. To say like even before COVID, with all the things that have been happening around us with terms of technology, transformation, disruption, et cetera, et cetera, what you need to do is to say, look, it can't be business as usual. What you see in COVID is the following, which is if you don't pay attention. So remember I talked about danger. Here's an example of all kinds of companies that are amongst the best and the biggest companies that are actually in trouble. You will recognize all of these companies. But what you also have with crisis is opportunities. And you can say, look, you know, when I talk about opportunities, most of these companies seem to be digital upstarts. Let me just put it in context. One of the companies that I'm working with is actually a company that's actually helping dairy farmers in the north of India figure out how to leverage COVID as an opportunity to transform their business models. So it's not something that just works for these big companies, it's something that actually even works at a very, very granular scale, even at a small, medium-sized business. To me, the big thing is the following. Do you have the mindset to grapple with the challenge and realize while it is a danger, it could be an opportunity as well? And this is what we did in the book. And I'll spend a few minutes talking about the book and then I'll pass it over to Rajiv to questions. This is something that's forthcoming in the in October. This is a book that we wrote based on stuff that we've been doing with probably the senior most executive program at NCI, which is called the Advanced Management Program, which runs three times a year. And the participants in there are typically CEOs, CXOs. Okay? And what we do in there is the following. You are the CEO, you're the CXO. We tell them even before they come to either Fontainebleau or Singapore, we send them a slide deck. Tell us all the best things about your company. Tell us the worst things about your company. And then the challenge we have to them is the following. Imagine you have no resource constraints. When it comes to money, when it comes to talent, when it comes to technology, and you were pulled out of your current role and you were given a new charter, and the new charter was basically, how are you going to use these things to figure out how you could you destroy the business that you were leading before you came to NCI? Now, it sounds like a very, very bizarre question. And for many people, it is bizarre because they don't like to be asked this question. How are you going to kill your own business? Sounds uncomfortable. And for many of them, it actually sounds like, why are you doing this to me? But it is not uncommon. And what I have below is just an example to say this is not unusual. This is what Bezos did to one of his assistants who used to run their book business, the physical book business for Amazon. And he said, look, you know, I want you to think about what is next. And the way I want you to think about it is to say, look, you know, there are no constraints. By the way, your objective is to figure out how you kill your business. And you can ask yourself, what is so big about it? What is big about it is the following. Having done this work now for almost three plus years, what we've realized working with companies both in the program and then working with these leaders beyond the programs and what they do with us in terms of consulting with them, the exco, their boards, etc., etc., is the biggest change that needs to happen is in the leader's mindset. And the mindset needs to change, and the only way to change it is by asking the question we ask, which is actually very, very provocative. Because the flip side of our question is to say, look, you know, go to the leader, say, look, now get your ex-code, get your top leadership. How are you going to innovate? 
And what you've seen over and over again is they come up with things, but most of the things they come up with are incremental. Whereas what we've realized is when we now flip their mindset and say, forget about that, get out of it. You're now in charge of a new company and that new company's charters, how the hell are they gonna go after you and distract your business? And we actually push them further to say, it's not just your business. How could they actually disrupt your whole industry? And the reason we do that is the following. What we've seen even with COVID is the landscape of industries are changing. The way you used to do business before has completely changed. Look, industries, what you realize is across the board, what people are saying is whether I'm a consumer, B2C or B2B, I don't want to do things with my companies the way I used to do it before as a consumer. And so flipping this mindset is actually fundamentally important. And what leaders realize is when we flip the mindset and we say, look, now deliberate on how somebody might come after you and actually kill your business, their mindset changes. They no longer think incrementally. They actually now think much broader. It's no longer inside out. It's actually outside in. And they go way beyond. And that's what we do in the course of what we do in the program and what we write in the book. And this is what I want you to sort of walk across before I leave the floor open to Rajiv, which is to say the whole idea in the book is to say the way to create change is to start at the top. And the thing you need to do to change at the top is to change the mindset. And we call it the Phoenix Attitude. And the whole idea is to say, look, if you are willing to open your mindset, to say, look, how might somebody come after my business and actually corral the forces of disruption, which have actually built up more steam with COVID than even before? Because look at it, whether it's Satya Nadella or whether it's someone else, they're all saying what COVID has done is make change happen in months. That would have probably taken years before. Okay, and so the whole point of the exercise is to say, look, you can't let this be a three or five year exercise. This needs to be something that happens faster. And if you are gonna be open to looking at this, then the old adage, which says, look, you are your own best enemy, actually works to your advantage. By opening up, yourself to the possibilities of disruption, you actually open up to the possibilities of renewal. If on the other side, you don't wanna do it, this actually will create what I call a vicious cycle. When what you realize is many of the companies that have filed for bankruptcy over the past three months are companies that can blame COVID but you know, that's a convenient excuse. The real excuse is these are companies where the leaders have actually been sleeping at the wheels, but they've actually not thought through what should be their new vision for the future. And what COVID did essentially was just finish the, just kill them off. It was sort of like the cherry on the top. Say, so look, you know, you kept delaying the inevitable and now here's the inevitable in front of you. So in terms of what we do in the book, it's about saying, look, how do we change your mindset? And the book takes them through a series of stages, which is what we do in the course of the program and what we take people through in the course of the book. But the whole idea is the following. Disruption has been a constant. Okay, it's not something that's new. Probably the pace, is different. It's more than it was before. And I think what COVID has done is actually just accelerate the change. What disruption 
says is not that all legacy business models are completely dead. That is not the message in the book. The message in the book is the following. Legacy companies can still survive and can still renew. But what they need to recognize is they are good at certain things and they are not good at certain other things that they need to build up. By and large, what I have noticed over my 30 plus years of working with companies across the world is legacy companies are designed for incremental innovation. And by and large, they do it well and they do it better than anyone else. And there is nothing wrong with it. It is a needed skill today, but it's a needed skill even tomorrow, because this is what will keep the cash registers moving. Whether you're Walmart, or whether you're Microsoft, whether you're DBS, you have a legacy business, you need to make sure it runs because it generates the dollars. But what you also have to realize, like all of these companies have done, and just as this company that I'm working with in the north of India, which is about as legacy as it comes, a bunch of dairy farmers, is to say, look, what got you here will not help you going forward. And there are three things that I want to highlight, which I think are particularly important, especially from an L&D and an HR perspective, is the talent that you need to execute the new ideas is actually very different from the talent that you need to execute the day-to-day -day business. The doers are damn good at what they do, but the doers are actually not the people who can help you train. And as an L&D person, as an HR person, it is extremely important. This is what I've heard from talking to a bunch of companies and CEOs to say, look, what I need to do is to figure out for me to be better tomorrow, it is not about hiring new talent. Yes, you need to hire new talent, new competencies that you don't have. But what you also need to realize is within your company, you actually have the dreamers. How do you identify them? And how do you give them the space? The other thing that a lot of CEOs have realized is they may think of themselves as visionaries, but they don't have all the answers. What they need to do is become a lot more humble and think of themselves not as leaders who can say, here's what we're going to do. This is it. This is it. But think of themselves more as gardeners, which is to say, look, what can I do to help the doers do what they do and do it best? Support them, encourage them, tell them you are still important. At the same level, to realize for renewals, what I need is a bunch of dreamers. How do I increase them? How do I support them? And more important as a leader, how do I create an ecosystem that helps both of these people connect with one another? Because the problem with most organizations is left to themselves, these two will kill one another. And it's the job of the leader to figure out not just how do I create an environment, but how do I work with my LMD? How do I work with the HM? How do I create the organization design? How do I create the organization structure? How do I create the processes and the systems that will enable these two gene pools to coexist and then help these two gene pools to create a new this is not rocket science. I put down four companies that are as legacy as they come, who've shown they can do it. But it, what, what it requires is a different mindset. And the mindset that it needs, needs to start not just at the top, but it needs to be cascaded all the way through. Okay, so that's it. Rajiv, I will stop here. And now the floor is all yours. Hey, thank you so much, Paddy. That was uh, uh, super interesting. So I have a few questions with me. Um, the first one is uh, something that caught my attention perhaps last uh, month or so 
there was some news article which said uh, parle g uh, the biscuit brand right um, had the highest sales ever during covid and if you remember just last year they were about to lay off a lot of people and suddenly the crisis happens and then you see this organization coming back uh, right um, better than before and that got me uh, thinking about what nicholas talib uh, talks about in his book anti fragile uh, basically systems that become stronger in the presence of uh, stress or adversity does the phoenix encounter method actually help us identify or build anti fragile companies the ones that will become better in the face of stress so raji you <coughs> been an engineer so you will appreciate the something called hysteresis yeah okay and what we encourage the people when we work with them is to actually use the phoenix encounter across the board within the organizations and to cascade it not just from the board but to all level staff yeah and to do it repeatedly because what he realizes in today's world there's no constant there are so many things that are changing literally you know weekly month by monthly so this needs to be something that organizations need to do on an on an ongoing basis so the companies that we have worked with typically what we encourage them to do is to say look engage this if you can on an ongoing basis ideally you know 6 months to a year and ideally across the levels of the organization because what you want is to be able to pick up the ideas that come across the levels of the organization what we realized is you know senior management if they think they have all the answers that is wrong they don't have all the answers often times people in the front line like the guys at the corner store or you know raji this is amazing so one of the friends that i was talking to is the ceo of one of a very very big grocery chain in the midwest in the us and like you understand the us has been humongously impacted by the corona virus he said his best ideas for how to change how they set up the store actually came from his store personnel when he actually walked with them and they said look here's what we see how consumers are behaving here's what they seem to be scared of here's what we need to do in terms of how we change the store layout so my point here is to say look the kind of thinking that's needed to renew is not something that only senior management is privy to it needs to be cascaded it needs to be ongoing and it needs to be sort of become a constant renewal within the organization so long winded answer to your question but there you go yeah that means him so uh, request all of you to post your questions on either the chat window or the q and a box um, i'll keep going on with my questions but keep your questions flowing and i'll uh, help moderate that the next question i had um, adi is um, so this is in response to a crisis right um, the, the whole phoenix um, you know analogy is coming from greek mythology where the phoenix gets reduced to ashes and it rises again so and you and, and i hear you say you need to do this regularly 6 months a year or so but um, what what is the challenge that you have noticed with companies uh, finding the right time to do this right sometimes you need a burning platform to galvanize the entire organization and build the momentum towards something and doing this repeatedly does that tire the organization out in a way it does but <clears throat> here's another story for you okay and this is another company which actually is gone through a lot of hard times 
and what they told me is the time we need to do this is actually the time when we are doing well because what they said was and it's fascinating i won't tell you the name of the company because i had to sign an nda with them they said look we were doing so well we thought we were doing great and then the ceo said look you know wait a second i'm not sure we are doing so well and within a space of 3 years their business revenues went down by 60% so to think that you know this is an exercise that you want to do only when you are in trouble is probably not right okay because i think in many cases what you realize is look you know there are enough public evidence you look at blockbuster or you look at blackberry or you look at nokia or you look at a bunch of the other guys what you realize is when things started going south with them for the first 2 3 years their revenues actually went up yeah and it's only after that that it created and it created dramatically so to think that you need to do something like this only when you're in trouble is actually misplaced advice and our point is to say look the reason to do this is not to tire you emotionally but actually the reverse to actually charge you to think of new possibilities and work on this in terms of pilots yeah. so what we do when we work with companies is to say look come out with a list of ideas prioritize them figure out what are the pilots you want to work on and then create those dedicated teams give them the resources that you want them to do and then let them run and then evaluate these things every 3 6 9 months etc and see how it unfolds and that actually energizes the whole organization because what they realize is there are new possibilities as opposed to suddenly saying oh my god we are stuck and now suddenly we need to reset which is wrong god that's brilliant so there's a question from uh, smriti sharma and i had a similar question um uh, like hers So I remember when we uh, developed the crisis simulation with you many years ago. Um, there were four, um, you know, industry sectors that we focused on: durables, semi-durables, non-durables, and services. And all of them uh, react to a crisis very differently, right? And they come out of a crisis differently as well. So Smriti's question uh, is, you know, as organizations, big and small, strive to leverage the crisis and come out of this. what do you foresee as a common challenge what, you know cutting across all these sectors what will be a common challenge and is there going to be something unique to durable semi durables non durables and services as they come out of this crisis anything that leaders can look at and say hey this is a wave that that i can ride very very interesting question give me a second to collect my thoughts sure okay look in terms of the impact that covid is going to have on these sectors those patterns at least from the data that i have seen over the past couple of months because i have looked at the data across economies for may june is not that different from what we wrote in our paper okay 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 so that part is not that different and for those of you interested take a look there are a couple of articles in the ft wall street journal uh, as well as new york times that are actually looking at the changes in customer credit card spends across categories and what that means for b2c companies and then how it goes from b2c companies to 
the implications for B2B companies. So it's just cascading upward. So that part is not very, very different. Yeah. But I think the question that you're getting at, which I suspect is something I need to think through a bit more carefully, but here's a few starting points is to say, look, there is something that COVID has done, which is fundamental, which is early on, you and I as consumers, whether it's B2C or B2B, always said, look, you know, if we thought that some product or brand or service was phenomenal, we would do whatever it takes to get it. Okay, if it means going to the LVMH store in the Champs Elysees or going to a temple or going to whatever it is, we will go do it because we care for it. I think what has happened in the COVID environment is people are beginning to say, look, you know, I do care about what I want because I do care about quality. But I think people are also becoming a lot more circumspect about saying it's no longer just about what I want. It's also about how I want to buy, how I want to consume, how I want to experience. Okay. And where I'm going with this is to say, look, for companies, for leaders, for people in the organization, what this means is the way you did what you did with your products or services before, in terms of what you did, maybe those things don't need to be the same tomorrow. And I think that to me is where the rubber will hit the road, which is to say, look, you know, the companies that will do better tomorrow is to say, given this new world, I may still do the same thing. Like this company that I'm working with, a dairy farmer, at the end of the day, they're still selling milk. How much more basic can it get? But can I sell milk now differently than the way I did before in this world, which is COVID infested, but also in this world, which is blessed because I have IoT, AI, ML, you name it. And so as a dairy farmer in the world before COVID, every dairy farmer did this, 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 this. In the post COVID world, do I need to keep doing the same things before? Or can I change? So the whole landscape of the organization in terms of the activities, in terms of the tasks, and going from there to the talents, and then to the strategies needs to change. And to me, that I think is the big question. And I think that is probably where you're getting at. And I think that is what organizations need to deal with and come up with answers to. Great. So just building on uh, what you mentioned about talents and team, uh, I think there's a great question from Pia. Uh, she asks this question, do organizations build new teams with such people or can existing, existing teams do it? Uh, in your experience, you know, how successful are companies trying to take the existing talent into transform the mindset versus building brand new teams. Is that easier? And uh, what are some pros and cons of both of these approaches? See, what I've <clears throat> learned from my experience working with this over the past three years is most organizations underestimate the amount of talent they have and overestimate the impact of talent that they bring in. And so to me, what you need is a mix of the two because there are things that you have which you don't appreciate and which probably are not completely up to snuff. But there are also things you need to bring on board. And what you realize is 
putting all of these things together is not easy, which is why, you know, for HR and L&D, this is probably the biggest challenge, which is to say, look, how do I create an organization and a culture where these people can coexist? Okay, and this, if we just leave it to HR and L&D is not correct. This is something which needs to be supported across the board to say, look, going forward, it is a collective journey. Got it. Um, so questions are flooding in, so I'll try my best to moderate this well. Um, so there's a question from Vijay uh, who asks this question on the mindset. What are the top three qualities that you noticed while working with these leaders, the, the Phoenix leaders uh, with the Phoenix attitude? What are the top three qualities of such leaders? The first is actually humility. Okay. <clears throat> and you know, the first three qualities are actually, if you Google and you look at something called the sedenty prayer, and there's actually a good three lines, which is to say, look, you know, I know what I know. Let me also acknowledge what I don't know. And then give me the faith and the courage to figure out how do I go forward. The second thing that I've realized is the best leaders are those who say, look, you know, I will actually work with the people I have within my organization and get them on board because the leaders who think they can do it all by themselves actually they are foolish it's not just that they won't have all the answers themselves they also have to be open to the idea that many of these things are things that will come up organically they have to create the structure and the environment and the space for these things to happen. And then the last thing that I've sort of seen with leaders is people who can actually get their board and their exco on the same journey. Because once you have that, then the rest of the organization actually realizes they are not working by themselves, that you know they have the full steam ahead which is this is not just one person doing it. This is not just the exco doing it. This is something that's actually being supported across the breadth of the organization. And that is what I found useful, which is to say, look, how can we, in a way, if I were to use an analogy, the best leader is like, you know, the conductor of an orchestra. And the orchestra has so many players, just as an organization has so many players. And so the best leaders are those who can be the best conductors. And remember the conductors are never the best composers, really. Okay, that's a brilliant analogy right there. So um, this is a question I had in mind. George um, has a, a question as well. In times of crisis, we are required to firefight and fireproof. Uh, and natural human tendency, I guess, is to um, stick to what you know, uh, right? Go back to your roots and go back to your basics. Um, and at the same time, the recommendation is at this time, try and figure out something new. Do your uh, Phoenix spotting and then uh, try and figure out your way out of this, right? In your experience, how easy is it for organizations to do these two activities simultaneously? It is not difficult. Okay, I mean, what you have to do is realize you need to do both. And you need very, very different talents to be able to do both. And so what I have seen is, look, As a company, I need to figure out what do I need to do to make the cash register ring? I mean, Raji, let's take NCI. 
what I need as a school, as a business school, is to say, look, what do I need in the faculty to make sure what we do in our degree programs, MBA, works well? So how do I get the existing faculty to do what they do, do it well, but probably do it given that now we are going to do it online as opposed to face to face. Ilian can't hire 60, 100 new faculty. Not done. And doesn't need to either. But the flip side is also for Ilian to be able to create the space for the INSEAD faculty to say, look, fine, this is the new world. Who are the people who are coming up with new ideas? What do I need to give them the space to run with it? And some of the people who are coming up with new ideas might actually be emeritus faculty who don't know how to teach online. But the whole idea is to say, look, as the leader, what you need to do is to figure out you need to corral the talent to do what each of them can, let them do it well, and then you figure out how do you let your garden grow. So the analogy we use in the book is to say the best CEOs are not we do this, we do this, we do this, we do this, we do this. But to say, look, you know, yes, I'll have ideas. I will have my own way of thinking about it. But at the end of the day, this may require a variety of talents doing a variety of different things. How do I create an ecosystem within the organization that actually allows all of these things to flourish? Because in its absence, it's not going to work. Got it. So there's a, a question from Rajat. Uh, he uh, has this question. What is the first step once we agree that there is a need for change? Uh, traditionally, we've, we've been taught, you know, do, a, do your SWOT analysis, uh, understand your relative strengths, weaknesses, and so on. Um, or suddenly there's a, a pandemic of the scale that, that hits us, right? Which is in which case you are more reactive this whole situation. So how do you, what are some tools that we can use? I guess is the question is, do you recommend a SWOT analysis or is there anything that can help you forecast or predict what might happen? And look, look, forecasting is snake oil. Okay. In terms of anyone who tells you, I can help you forecast what's going to happen tomorrow. Take it with a pinch of salt. I think Based on the question that was asked, the way I would start with is to say, look, you know, this is what was your SWOT before. My feeling is, given the new circumstances and the new reality, that SWOT that you had before is probably irrelevant. That many of the things that you thought were your strengths before will probably be your weaknesses. The first thing is to do is to say, look, you know, given what has happened today with COVID, with everything else, are my strengths as relevant? And what are my new threats? And given all of those things, that is where I would then connect it to say, look, you know, if I were to go outside in, outside my organization for five minutes and say, look, you know, if I were to do something different, how would I kill my business? What would this business have that I don't have? That is the question to ask, okay? Which is what you realize is if you were to step out and you were to create a whole new company that would figure out how to disrupt you, that company may have a very different SWOT than your company. 
And that is where I would start. And then say, look, what are the implications of that in terms of how do I build my defense? That was brilliant. So, uh, Barry, a question here. So you um, uh, quoted Jeff Bezos, uh, right? And this example where he said, hey, resources are unlimited. Um, go kill your own business, right? But in today's context, um, you know, number one, as somebody pointed out on the uh, Q&A, um, roughly 30% of small and medium enterprises uh, are facing some sort of an existential threat. Uh, no revenue, financial resources are not available. Uh, so that's uh, one. Second is, um, now in this context, how do you, do you think about killing your own business or, you know, what should the, that mindset be? Firstly, you know, what is your take on so many companies uh, facing that existential threat. Uh, what is your take on that? Uh, second is, if you don't have unlimited resources like Jeff Bezos does, right? Um, what is your method for doing this then? So uh, I heard you mention, you know, you can start with some pilots, but pilots can be unsuccessful as well. Um, and that's uh, Saud's question. You know, how do you know that um, when to stop, right? Uh, your first pilot could be uh, unsuccessful or your execution of the pilot could be unsuccessful. So how do you, what's the method for getting this right? No, look, <clears throat> it's a very, very fair question. And it's a very valid question. The way I think about it is the following. It's not about resources. It's actually about imagining is it possible that you can do what you do differently than the way you used to do it before? Or is it possible that given whatever it is that you have inside you and your organization, can you do very different things than you did before? And if it turns out for either of these two questions, you actually come up with some answers, then it's about figuring out how do you resource it appropriately. The question about you no, know, how many of these are gonna pay off? The answer is it's, it's like a power law, okay? It's never the case that if you do 10 projects, seven out of 10 will pay off, they don't. So you need to be careful in terms of figuring out how you choose. And this is where the reality comes in. But at the end of the day, if as senior management, if as people in L&D and HR, you're open to say, look, you know, let's sort of use the wisdom of the crowd. So whatever other mechanisms you can think of to say, look, what seem to be better ideas than the other, as opposed to your thinking, what you think is right. My feeling is those work better. Okay. But not doing anything is not an answer. Got it. Awesome. So there's a question from um, Jafar. He says, um, his question is slightly geopolitical in nature. Will the current crisis break national barriers and create more? Uh, protection, protectionist regimes. So we already are seeing, you know, countries sending back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think, look, that's, it's, it's a fair question. Okay. And I think given what's going on with COVID, anybody who says otherwise is probably being a hopeless optimist. Uh, but that said, what I think people don't realize and don't appreciate is at the end of the day, the whole world has actually become better off because of globalization over the past 30 years. I mean, it's great for you know leaders like Trump and Johnson and others to sort of get on board and say, you know, you'll be nationalist. But they're foolish to say they can sort of put the genie back in the bottle because if they do, the amount of chaos they want to create domestically is 
humongous. I mean, let's take a step back. Think of something as basic as food. 80% of food that's consumed in the world today is actually not made domestically. So it doesn't matter which leader spews what nonsense. If you're going to shut down your borders and you're going to say, I'm going to shut it down, you're going to run out of food. And so when I look at this nationalistic dialogue at one level, I can understand why the politicians are coming from this. At another level, I sort of say, look, you know, this is completely at odds with reality, which is to say, look, at the end of the day, what has happened with globalization over the past 30 years, it's been very good. It's not perfect. And we've seen the chaos it has created with, you know, disruptions in supply chain, uh, shortages, etc., etc. So it's not perfect. But to say now we can pull it all back and shut the doors, to me, is stupid. Okay, so I may be on one extreme side on this perspective, but I think, you know, the world actually has gotten better because of it. Yes, it has created all kinds of problems in terms of inequality, whether it be inequality with companies, whether it be inequalities with employees, whether it be inequalities with income. All of these are real problems. And I'm not sort of saying these are not true. They need to be addressed. But to me, for people to think the way to address it is to close down the borders, I think is nonsensical. Okay, so we've got a few uh, questions around talent. I'm going to try and combine these questions. Uh, one is an observation that uh, crisis will definitely increase the demand of multi people, um, right? Because of the shortage of uh, resources, I think people will probably do double hatting, triple hatting. Uh, so that might happen as an observation. Um, so Gaurav says, um, and, and this is something that I've experienced as well. So how do you facilitate uh, mind, shed, mind, mind, mind shift um, in senior management, right? Um, and when we work with L&D leaders, uh, especially when it comes to senior leadership, how do you change their minds? Uh, rest of the organization is fine. We'll find a way to do it. But how do we change these people's minds? Because they've been there, done that. To challenge them internally is, a, uh, is, a, is quite a task. Uh, what, what works in the scenario? See, what works in the scenario is to actually take them out of the inertia. And ideally, what works is like the kind of thing we do in the encounter, which is put them with a bunch of other com people, ideally from other companies, not from within the same company. And suddenly they realize, you know, I thought I was in a good place and I realize I'm not. So your point is well taken, Rajiv. The whole thing that we've learned over the three years is the key is to change the mindset. And then everything sort of takes its course from there on. Okay, so to me, the companies that we worked with over the past three years where we've done this, they've cascaded it down. And the cascading process actually works. But it needs to be nurtured. You can't simply say, look, you know, this is going to be top down. It needs to be something that they also get on board. And then they realize, okay, there are things I'm good at, which I can still contribute. There are things that I have a sort of a blind spot. Okay, so I think what I'm getting at here is the following, which when you are with an L and D H and R position, what you also need to realize is there are some people for whom putting them through this process of opening the eyes is probably a good thing. 
there are some people for whom you know what they are good at is stitching to the knitting and if it turns out that is important and you want to have make sure that that happens let them stay there it can't be overboard and everybody go through all of this because that stuff doesn't work awesome we've reached the top of the hour paddy um very very insightful hour spent with you uh, really thankful to you for uh, spending this time with us and sharing the um, contents of your book uh, looks like a very promising book and i will look out for it uh, in october when it comes out and i'd recommend all of you to read it having known paddy um, for so many years now i can vouch for the quality of his thinking and writing as well so um, thanks once again paddy for sharing all of these insight was tremendously useful and um, thank you all the attendees for uh, spending your time with us the recording will be shared uh, later with you and um, yeah stay safe and hopefully we'll come out of this uh, stronger perfect right thanks for thank you all of you take care and stay safe thank you buddy